You're listening to the Literary Atlanta Podcast. I'm Allison Law. I'm recording this episode on Sunday, September 30th, 2018, otherwise known as International Podcast Day. I know, I know, there's a designated day for everything now. Yesterday was National Coffee Day. But before you throw your hands up, take a look at the tweets and social media messages organized around the hashtag International Podcast Day. You may discover something new about the medium that's connecting us and about your fellow earbud buddies. According to social media company Buffer, there are more than 525,000 active shows and 18.5 million individual episodes on Apple Podcast. That's the leading podcast platform formerly known as iTunes. And unlike watching videos on Facebook or YouTube, Podcast listeners are more likely to finish an episode. Buffer's research says that 80% of people polled listen to all or most of a podcast episode. Here's another interesting factoid for you. 19% of listeners increase the speed. Do you do that? I'm certainly in that bucket. I tend to increase the speed to 1.25 or 1.5 when I'm listening to a podcast or audiobook. Somehow I get some false sense of accomplishment or feel like I'm finishing faster if I listen to it faster. However you listen to me, at regular speed, sped up or slowed down, I'm grateful. In the past 13 months, we've experienced incredible growth. We more than surpassed our goal of 10,000 downloads in the first year. And we have some interesting things on the horizon. So stick around. From international podcasting to a transatlantic love affair born of letters. Yes, we're talking about lettered intellectuals who first learned about each other because they were part of the publishing industry, were avid readers and incredible writers, But I also mean the real tactile kind of letters, the ones that we wrote by hand or typed with a typewriter, actual words imprinted on paper that we then folded and stuffed into stamped envelopes and entrusted to letter carriers. It was a time when we waited days and weeks to receive a reply, to know that our message had been delivered and had prompted the recipient to write a response. If today's story hadn't taken place in the 1950s, if the two people in question hadn't first bonded as pen friends, if there hadn't been a healthy dose of divine intervention and spiritual contemplation, there might never have been a marriage between writers C.S. Lewis and Joy Davidman. And for the first time, we as readers come to understand how this unlikely love story evolved from Joy's perspective. You will learn more about the woman who was and would become so much more than Mrs. Lewis in a new novel from Patty Callahan. My conversation with Patty is next on episode 48 of Literary Atlanta. Atlanta is a book town home to avid readers and host to some of the finest writers and storytellers on the planet. That's my thesis statement, and this podcast provides the supporting details through behind-the-scenes anecdotes, author interviews, and all of the ways that you can experience the rich literary landscape right here in Literary Atlanta. Patty Callahan is a New York Times best-selling author. She's been a finalist for the Townsend Prize for Fiction, an Indie Next Pick, an Okra Pick, and has been nominated multiple times for the Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance Novel of the Year. Her work has also been included in short story collections, anthologies, magazines, and blogs. One of her essays, entitled Sublimely Conroy, is featured in the recently released book, Our Prince of Scribes, Writers Remember Pat Conroy. Patty attended Auburn University for her undergraduate work and Georgia State University for her graduate degree. Once a pediatric clinical nurse specialist who lived in Atlanta, she's been writing full-time for many years now. She splits her time between Mountain Brook, Alabama and Bluffton, South Carolina. She returns to Atlanta on Tuesday, October 2nd to celebrate the release of her 14th novel. Those who have read Patty's other books may notice something missing from the cover and title page when they pick up a copy of her new book, Becoming Mrs. Lewis. I began our Skype conversation by asking about this change. 
Becoming Mrs. Lewis is a little bit of a departure for you. It's a little different from your other books. Um, the first difference that anyone will notice is when they look at the book, it's not Patty Callahan Henry, it's Patty Callahan. Can you tell us how this book is different for you? You know, the, the name change from Patty Callahan Henry to Patty Callahan to me doesn't seem so much a name change as like maybe they forgot to keep typing. I don't know. Yeah. But it's um, it's nothing more than an indication of genre change. So it's not such a drastic difference that I would use a nom de plume and, and combine my children's names, Megan Thomas, and become someone else altogether. It's much more just an indication of this is still a woman's story. This is still a story of transformation. This is still a story about love and its vagaries. And yet it's also... Um, historical instead of contemporary. And it's also about two living, you know, people who were once alive in the world, real people, instead of imagined people. And my other 13 novels are, you know, completely imaginary characters, where this novel is set and based in a real place and on two historic figures, and beloved historic figures. So, so the name change only had to do with an indication of a slight shift in genre. Got it. Becoming Mrs. Lewis, as you mentioned, is a work of historical fiction. It's told from the first person perspective of Joy Davidman, who, if you look at the materials, it says she's the improbable love of C.S. Lewis, a writer who's probably best known as the person behind the Chronicles of Narnia. What made their love story so improbable? Oh, wow. I mean, everything. <laughs> there wasn't any reason that they should have ever met, much less been friends, much less have fallen in love, and oh, no way married. She was 16 and a half years his junior. She was a, a very accomplished literary figure in New York in the 40s and 50s. She was married with two children living in upstate New York. And he, like, let's flip to the other side of the ocean. He was an Oxford Don who lived and taught in Oxford, England at Maudlin College, had never left Ireland or England, and was at that point known as a Christian apologist. When they first started writing to each other, she wrote to him first. When they first started becoming pen pals or pen friends, he had not yet published Narnia. He'd written a couple of them, but he hadn't published them. But there was how in the world would these two people in the 1940s and 50s have ever met? It was completely improbable. And she does, as you mentioned, start this correspondence with him because she has had in her midlife a change from being a self-proclaimed atheist to a believer. And he has had a similar experience. And then they have these these people in common. So they start writing with each other. And in interspersed in your chapters, you have these bits of correspondence between them. Are those completely imagined words? Or are they based on your research of the letters that these two people exchanged? So it's a mixed bag answer, because um, yes, Joy Davidman had this crazy mystical experience um, that's in the novel, and she didn't understand it. It was it, it baffled her. And she was a genius. She was an intellectual genius, and she never let anything rest. She was a true seeker of always the truth. Yes, she was an atheist. And yet when she had this experience, she didn't want to just shove it off into the category of you know, something strange that happened. She spent years researching what it could possibly mean. She researched every world religion. She read, she wrote, and she ran across Lewis's writings and an article written about him. And she had read him previously in her life. So she thought, well, here's somebody who who can give me some answers. He seems that he's already researched and, and dove deep into what this might mean. So she wrote to him, not because she already agreed with him. She wrote to him because she wanted to, she wanted to banter with him and, and try to figure out what was happening to her. And she thought he might have some answers. 
Um, so when she wrote to him, they started this correspondence, but all those letters have been destroyed. Oh, you're kidding. They they were destroyed. None of them remain. They're gone. I have met her son and talked to him and he, he, I said, are they really gone or are you just not telling me where they are? You know, he said, no, they're, they're gone. A lot of Lewis's papers were burned at his death. So none of those letters in my novel are exactly what they wrote to each other because those are destroyed. But what they are is based on the letters and the correspondence and the essays and the poetry and the writings that they were doing at that time. Other letters have been saved, most specifically the letters they wrote to other people. The letters that were written to them have been lost. But there are volumes of books of her published and unpublished letters. Her unpublished letters are stored at the Wade Center at Wheaton College in Chicago. And then there are volumes of published and same for him. There are volumes of his published letters during the time that they were writing to each other. So I was able to look at what was important to them at that time, what they were writing to other people about at that time, what they cared about at that time, what was concerning them at that time, what they what she was writing in her poetry or her essays and same for him, so that I was able to extrapolate what they might have written to each other. The short answer is that they were imagined. But the long answer is that they were imagined based on what they were writing at that time. Wow, that's amazing. When Joy Davidman started corresponding with C.S. Lewis, she was married and had two children and was living in upstate New York. And then he was on the other side of the ocean. And she was in an unhappy marriage. And I can imagine that when you're a pen friend with someone and you're having these really intimate discussions and the way that you that you describe their relationship in the book you know she feels like she can be completely honest with him that she has no filter with him about what's happening in her life and what's happening in her heart in terms of her her spiritual seeking she writes in here must the most awful parts of childhood always turn into unconscious urges that influence our life for all time so she's asking him these really deep and profound questions and and he's doing the same with her and that starts to kind of unravel this already frayed marriage that she is in with her husband bill what would that relationship have have been like in this era. I'm always thinking about that, the time period. It's it's not a time where men and women could have such intimate relationships outside of marriage. Right. I think what was fascinating for me was that she was able to put it into words with who a man who was essentially a stranger, exactly how she felt and what she knew. And maybe that's why she was able to do that. But I also feel that that's how joy was in the world. Anyway, there was no pretense. She, she cared too much about her quest for the truth to, to, to kind of parse her words. I think she found an intellectual equal in him. And he said the same thing about her, that it was, he used the words iron on iron, that that once they started writing to each other, it clarified even more so what they thought or believed because they would sharpen each other's wit and, and questions and go back and forth. And I think that it would be harder today and is harder today to do such a thing because everything's so instantaneous, right? Mm -hmm. We shoot an email, we shoot a text. When do we take the time to sit down and write a long letter about what we actually think and believe and then spend the time waiting for the response so that we can sharpen what we then think and feel in return? So I, I, that's the other part about this being so improbable is that in today's world, it would have been much easier for them to meet. She could have shot him a text. She could have shot him an email. Um, she would have known he would have known what she looked like and she would have known what he looked like. But this this is 1950. She probably knew what he looked like because he'd been on the cover of Time magazine. But he didn't know what she looked like. How could he have? You know, unless she put a photo in a letter. So it's it's not a, a, a relationship today wouldn't develop in the same way um, based on words and intellect and and sparring. It would it, it they might fall in love today, but in a much different way. Well, she decides for a number of reasons to travel and to meet him. And 
not only does she find herself starting to fall for him, I think she really fell in love with the countryside there, with London and with Oxford and the places that she visited on that trip. Can you talk about that first trip that Joy took? Oh, gosh, you just gave me the chills. The like, you nailed it chills, because that is exactly what happened. She wrote when she very first got there, one of the very first things she said was, I have become a true Anglophile because she fell in love with the countryside, with the people, with um, the friendliness, with the with the atmosphere, with um, the whole milieu. Um, when I was doing my research, I went over there and I have to say I the exact same thing happened in a, for me, but in a much, much smaller way. I was only there for a few days, not months. And of course, I didn't get to meet Lewis mm-hmm. or the Inklings. I think I use the words and they're, they're imagined words, but she says, you know, I see out of the side of my eye a completely different way of living. And I believe that's what happened to her when she went over there is that she saw and felt a much different way of life. And, and when, when that happens to us and when it happened to her, it puts into stark relief the life she was living. So all of a sudden, the life she was living, she could see the abuse, the alcoholism, the misery, because it was set in, in bas relief against what she saw and felt there. Yes. I love this blurb that Paula McLean gave you that says, Patty Callahan seems to have found the story she was born to tell. I'm wondering when you knew that you were destined to tell Joy's story. Oh, I mean, isn't that like the nicest blurb that could possibly exist on the cover of a book? That's a pretty nice blurb. Yeah, yeah. I am beyond grateful for it. I I wouldn't, it's very hard to say that about yourself. I mean, I wouldn't say, oh, I was born to tell this. Like that feels... I feels a little magnanimous to self. I don't know, but... um, (laughs) That's a lot of pressure, yes. Yeah, I don't, you know, I think I was born for a lot of reasons. I don't know just this, but I do know that it was the right time for me to write this book. Um, I keep being asked if I wish, if I wish I had written this earlier or if I had headed down this trail before, um... And, and, and no, I believe in divine timing. And I believe that I wrote this when I was supposed to write it. And I believe I could not have written it without writing the other 13 novels I wrote, every single one of which I love. Um, so I don't, I don't know how destined I was to write it. I know that the second I spoke it out loud, the second I said, um, I'm going to write about C.S. Lewis's wife, there was absolutely no turning back. And I had a thousand excuses not to write this book. It's not in my genre. I'm under contract for my other novels. I don't know anything about that time period. Um, I've never even been to Oxford. Like I had more excuses than I had reasons to write it, but she would not let me go. There was no way after I said it out loud. And that goes back to what I talk about in the novel, which is words have power. And there was no way after I said it, that I could then not do it. And the first time I said it out loud, I don't even know if I'd consciously been thinking it. I was at a gathering of a little tribe of my writer friends who live in Nashville. I was talking to Ariel Lahan, who we all love and adore her and her work. Yes, definitely. When you're talking about historical fiction, that's that's one person you need to know. Exactly. And And she's also a dear friend. And and we were having a conversation and I wasn't in, I mean, to be honest, I wasn't in a good place. I felt at a dead end in my work. This is years ago. She asked the question, I think all writers should ask each other at times of, of despair. And that is, or maybe even not in despair, just the question we should ask each other, which is what would you write if you could write about anything you wanted? I said, I would write about C.S. Lewis's wife. I don't know why I said it. I hadn't been thinking about it. I hadn't even started my research. I didn't have notes all over my office. I didn't, I mean, I had C.S. Lewis books all over my office, but um, she looked back at me and she got that look, that aerial look. And she said, if you don't write that, I am. And I said, oh no, 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 I'm on it. I've got this. (laughs) 
And that next morning, I was staying at another one of our beloved author's houses, our sweet Lisa Patton. Mm. And I stood in her kitchen and ordered book after book after book after book about Joy Davidman. I had Lewis's books, but I didn't have hers. I ordered books by her. I ordered books about her. I started downloading essays. I started reading her poetry. I began the very next day and didn't stop. That's incredible because like you, I definitely knew C.S. Lewis. I knew him as a child when I first discovered the line, The Witch in the Wardrobe. But I didn't hear or know anything about Joy until Shadowlands became a big movie. And I went back and went to the IMDb to find out when that was. I didn't think it was that long ago, but it said it was 1993 when that movie came out, starring Deborah Winger and um, Anthony Hopkins. When did you first learn about her or about their relationship? Was it through his writing? Um, I think first time, you know, I've thought about this a lot because people, people ask me like, when is the first time you heard about her? And, and I, I think the first time I heard about her was when I read his book, A Grief Observed, which is his book about his grief after she died, which is profound. It's one of the best books on grief ever written, of course. Um, so I've always been fascinated with like, what kind of woman and so enchants a man that she destroys his life and almost his faith when she passes away. And then of course I had Deborah Winger in my mind. Um, and the difference in those stories told like his grief. And then the story told in that movie is that those are about her. So especially Shadowlands, that is a movie that is about her dying and that effect of her dying on C.S. Lewis. None of it, nothing has been ever written from her, except her own books, of course, her own poetry, essays, novels. I mean, she was she was a prolific writer. She won the Yale Younger Poets Award. She wrote two novels. She has essays. She has books on the Ten Commandments. She was a prolific writer. But it seemed that everything I knew about her was of the dying wife of C.S. Lewis Mm -hmm. and how that impacted other people. And I wanted to write as her. From her. So the novel is from the first person or in the first person as Joy Davidman. I wanted to write from behind her eyes. I wanted to tell her story. I often say that the backstory is now the story because the backstory of how she became C.S. Lewis's dying wife is the most interesting part. Like how they found each other, who she was in the world, what her background was, her writing, her poetry, how she ended up writing to him in the first place, like the backstory is the most interesting part. And that's what this novel does is tell it from behind her eyes. And I love that you share at the beginning of each chapter, some of her sonnets, some of her poetry. She was really an accomplished poet. She was a very accomplished poet. She won numerous awards for her poetry. Her very first volume of poetry was called Comrade in Arms. And it was poems about the Spanish Civil War. And she won the Yale Younger Poets Award for that collection. She was in her 20s. So, yeah, she was now the most interesting sonnets. And the ones that start her chapters were recently discovered only in 2015 in the back of a dusty closet in Oxford, England, of her best friend from Oxford's home, a woman named Jean Wakeman who said she did not have anything left of Joy's. And when she moved into a nursing home, her son went to help her clean things out. And they found a dusty box full of sonnets, um, short stories, essays. And so the sonnets or most of the sonnets that start the chapters are from those recently discovered love sonnets. Um, that have been published in a book by Don W. King, published in a book called A Naked Tree, Love Sonnets to C.S. Lewis and Other Poems by Joy Davidman. But those are brand new. You've already described how you first started researching with that fun online book buying spree. You've also mentioned that you got to travel to some of the places where Joy traveled. Tell us more about your research process for becoming Mrs. Lewis. Mm, It was probably the most fun I've ever had doing, quote, work, unquote. Um, The first thing I did was read, like I said, her poetry and her essays and her books. And then the next thing I did was 
get on a plane and go to Chicago. There is a place in um, Chicago called the Wade Center at Wheaton College, a little bit north of Chicago. And it is at the Wade Center that six of the most famous British authors of that time period are stored. Um, They have the papers of Tolkien and Lewis and Barfield and Dorothy Sayers. And they have, because of Lewis, they have all of Joy's papers. And so I went there to see her unpublished papers and her unpublished poems and her unpublished letters, most specifically her unpublished letters. There is a large volume of published letters, but I wanted to read her unpublished letters. And I did. And to hold her divorce decree, to hold her handwritten poetry, to hold a letter she was writing to Lewis that her son drew a little thing on, to hold her passport. She came alive in a whole new way. And then after that, I traveled to London and Oxford, and I called that trip um, walking in the footsteps of joy or walking um, in the places of joy. And I traveled, tried to hit all the places that are in the novel. Most specifically, once you read the novel, the day she got this specific letter from her husband, Bill, and she walked from London Tower to Westminster Abbey all the way up to St. Paul's Cathedral and the whispering gallery at the top of St. Paul's. And I walked those as if I was her and tried to feel what she'd been feeling and think what she'd been thinking as best I can on this side of her life. And then I went to Oxford and hit all the places of joy, you know, the bird and baby, which is where the Inklings would meet Mm. and the kilns where C.S. Lewis lived with his brother, Warren and Maudlin College. I got a private tour of Maudlin where he taught. He was the tutor of English literature at Maudlin College, walked all through Oxford University up to Headington Hill where they would go together to the pubs that they would frequent, to the church that they went to together, to the church where he sat in the pew and says he thought of the screw tape letters, to the path they would walk down to the Six Bells pub after church to get a beer. And I just followed these footsteps that I also put in the novel. And it was profound. It was it was amazing. And I was able, hopefully, to enrich the novel by the, walking in the in the steps that they walked together. For sure. Yeah. When, just having you mention the, um, the little drawing and the, and the dedication that he did to you, I, I'm just thinking of how you incorporated that into the story, which I will not share. I will let people read and enjoy that on their own. <laughs> Go get it right now. Hurry. Yeah. <laughs> we'll wait. We'll sit here and wait for you to get it. Um, okay. okay. Now we're back. <laughs> Uh, and the other thing that I love that you incorporated into the book over and over, which you begin the book with this beautiful prologue of Joy when she's 11 years old and her brother Patrick, who I believe is eight at the time, but it's the metaphor of the lion. And that comes up over and over again in different ways through the novel. Why is that metaphor so important to Joy And why is it so important to you? As I was researching them and started to see the connections between them before they even met. And I tried to thread those throughout the novel without going over the top with it. But the the threads that connect them that began 15, 20 years before they even crossed paths is is profoundly interesting. You know, she used to sneak out at night and visit the lions in the Bronx Zoo. And he's writing about Aslan and has lions who show up in his dreams. They both read George MacDonald at the same age, at the same time in their life. That book ended their lives at the same point. They both have the theme of masks and what those do for us in our life that thread throughout their work. And, and as each one of these things became more apparent, the, the lion um, seemed the most obvious. And it even followed her. She was a screenwriter for about six months in Hollywood. And she says it was one of the most hellacious times of her life. And in that time, her solace was Leo the lion at MGM. She would go visit. They had a real one and she would go visit it. And, and it reminded her of her childhood when she would sneak out of the zoo with her to the zoo with her brother. And that that theme of the great lion could not be ignored. So I opened with it. On Tuesday, October 2nd, you have two different opportunities to see Patty Callahan in Metro Atlanta. 
First, she'll be appearing at a luncheon hosted by Foxtail Bookshop in Woodstock. Your $60 ticket includes a nice lunch at Mad Life Stage and Studios and a copy of Becoming Mrs. Lewis. Then, Tuesday evening, beginning at 7 p.m., the Atlanta History Center will feature Patty Callahan in conversation with another Atlanta writer of historical fiction, Lynn Cullen. Now, the same night, October the 2nd, there are three other book events around town. Sally Kilpatrick brings a little bit of Christmas to Foxtail Bookshop. Carol Anderson will be talking about her latest work of nonfiction at the Georgia Center for the Book at Decatur Library Auditorium. And Georgia Weber will be at Karis Books and more. On Thursday, October 4th, Dacre Stoker, who is the great-grandnephew of Bram Stoker, author of Dracula, will bring his book, Dracul. Dracul. I cannot do Transylvanian accent. Dracul to Foxtail Bookshop. Yeah, enough of that nonsense. October the 4th, Fry Gillard will be at the Margaret Mitchell House. This Friday, October the 5th, Georgia Weber visits the Prince Avenue location of Avid Bookshop in Athens with her graphic memoir. And the same night, Friday, October 5th, Jody Pico, New York Times bestselling author of Small Great Things, comes back with her latest novel, A Spark of Light. She's going to be in conversation with another New York Times bestselling author, Emily Giffen of Atlanta, at SCAD Show. This is a ticketed event. Your ticket includes a signed copy of A Spark of Light. And if you are a pre-K through 12th grade teacher, Barnes & Noble is hosting its Educator Appreciation Days, October 6th through the 14th. Take a look. We'll include the link in our show notes. But Educator Appreciation Days happening at Barnes & Noble, October the 6th through the 14th. Remember, when you can, support these local booksellers and the authors they're hosting by buying a copy of the book at the event. Thank you for listening to this episode. As always, you can find links to the people, books, and events mentioned in the podcast on our website at literaryatlanta.com. You can listen to episodes there or download them wherever you like to get your podcast: Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Stitcher, Radio Public, or TuneIn. I'm Allison Law, your host. Until next time, take care and stay lit curious.